conscious about getting going. So um, good morning, everyone. And um, thank you for joining um, this breakfast webinar. And um, if anyone has any connection issues, if you use the chat function, I should be able to multitask and forward a troubleshooting email link or Sarah Sands from our marketing team is in the background as well and should be able to help. There's also a question and answer function. I suspect my technological limitations will mean that I can't do that on the hoof as I go, but certainly I'll do my best um, to pick up any questions and queries as we go. And um, for those that don't know me, welcome. I'm James Marrick. I'm a barrister who specializes in personal injury and clinical negligence. I'm in those teams at St. John's Chambers. Uh, the purpose of today's webinar is to discuss some of the issues in my recent case of Richards v. Birmingham Women's Children NHS Foundation Trust, a uh, recent High Court decision um, in, handed down by Her Honour Judge Kelly. Um, the aims for discussion of no more than about 30 to 35 minutes. Um, let's hope that I, um, uh, famous last words for Barrister, so I can stick to that time limit. Um, Richens was a liability trial um, with quantum and limitation issues agreed subject to liability arising out of a tragic stillbirth in 2008. Um, spoiler alert for those that haven't read the case, the claim failed at the very last hurdle on the final but ultimately crucial limb of causation. And um, I acted for Vicky Richens, the claimant, um, and it, it, the, the, the critical issue we, we failed on was whether the tragedy would have been avoided upon early transfer to the delivery suite. Um, why, you might ask, do you want to talk about a case you lost, James, um, in the High Court recently? Well, um, probably for a couple of reasons. Um, that The trial engaged issues both as to judicial fact-finding in the context of historic witness evidence and witness recollection and notes and the proper approach to considering the inherent accuracy of medical notes, which has been a hot issue over the last couple of years. And secondly, um, it also engaged the evidential principle of claimant, um, or, or, or as it's often known, key benevolence, the concept of how the judge should approach the reconstruction of the hypothetical counterfactual when it's the defendant's negligence which has created a black hole of information. And um, so the case is probably a useful springboard to a wider discussion on those evidential points. And um, I also I came into the case relatively late, so I'm perhaps a little less precious than I might have been um, in discussing a, a case which was ultimately a lost CFA case at trial. Um, so if so, if you just go on to the next PowerPoint for me. Um, if I could just perhaps look at the evidential issues in a little more detail first. And what I intend to do is look at the, the, the breach of duty issues and then the causation issues and their interaction with the evidential principles I've just looked at. Um, the focus today is really going to be on the evidential principles which arose in the case rather than on the medicine. If anyone has any separate queries on any of the, the midwifery or OBS issues which arise in the case, um, please do drop me a line, happy to discuss. Um, it was a, a, a very interesting case. We don't have many cases that, that get to trial. Um, I, on this slide, I've summarised the immediate background and issues to the case. Um, Vicky had been admitted as a high risk expectant mother to the antenatal ward um, on the 4th of July 2008, obviously the headline from 14 years ago before trial, and um, hypertension, intrauterine growth restriction, and um, she'd been an inpatient over the course of the weekend, relatively stable ops, um, but the, the case was all about whether things had changed on the Sunday evening, so that's Sunday 6th of July 2008. Um, Vicky's evidence, in perhaps an oversimplified nutshell, but, but which works for present purposes, what was that she'd become increasingly unwell on ward during the course of the evening of Sunday the 6th of July from about 5 or 6 p.m. onwards. Um, and that those symptoms and signs were on the, the PE spectrum, on the, on the preeclampsia spectrum, um, albeit never classic, classical PE symptoms. And, and, and Vicky's evidence was that this was a, a, a drastically busy ward that evening. 
uh, with an unfolding social services incident, number of other mothers going into labour, such that she, as much as she tried to get the attention of midwives um, and to tell them about symptoms and, and others on the ward to try, try to help her, um, ultimately um, they, they, they fell on deaf ears, as it were, just simply because it was such a busy ward. And, and she felt that the midwives had, had not given her the, the care uh, and and attention that she needed when she was desperately unwell and didn't feel right. Um, the, the notes suggested um, that it'd be nursing review at about 6 p.m. and 11 p.m. Um, the 6 p.m. note um, had documented some epigastric pain and there was a crossed out reference to a urine dip and it said, but, but uh, it said no proteinuria and that was crossed out. Um, the 11 p.m. note um, recorded expressly there was a complaint of pain under the ribs, but it sounds like rib flare, and it recorded expressly asymptomatic um, in square brackets for preeclampsia. And um, the defendant placed heavy reliance on the 11 p.m. notes and suggested the contents of the note in the absence of any attempt to complain during the night by Vicky strongly supported that there was no breach of duty. Um, and or any causative breach, i.e. her symptoms were, were never such that she ought to have been transferred to the delivery suite because that was the key causation issue. Causation issues even were rather, should suspicions have been so raised that actually it mandated ops review and then transfer to the delivery suite. And then upon transfer to the delivery suite, would there be have been a safe delivery of Vicky's baby, baby Chiron? Um, there was an eruption at 6.45 a.m. and unfortunately, um, baby didn't survive. Um, 10 past seven matters had sort of completed by. Um, so we come in March 22 to a liability trial. Um, and, and just pause in there. And, and if you could just go to the next slide for me, Sarah, I'd be grateful. Um, perhaps what doesn't come across from the judgment if one looks at it, um, is that the trust expected to succeed on the breach of duty conflicts of evidence arguments. Um, and I suspect that the breach of duty position rather than any causation argument is actually what drove it to trial. Um, you, if you've read the judgment, you may have picked out that a limitation issue had been compromised on a 50-50 basis. Um, there'd been a delay issue um, the Section 33 evidence adduced on behalf of Vicky to explain the delay and had to include um, past negative short form reports on breach of duty. Um, so it, 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 in a context where Vicky's evidence was ultimately in the context of a very traumatic experience, where the defendant had evidence from its midwives, which it said was backed up by its notes, where it said Vicky hadn't been consistent over time. Well, the, the, the defendant thought, well, actually, well, it was quite comfortable in breach of duty. Um, and Vicky had a fairly rocky time in the witness box. Um, her core narrative had remained unchanged over time. He was coming desperately well. But naturally, not least because she'd written her own letters, complaints and the like over time, there was inconsistencies and, and sort of sh sh subtle shifts in her accounts over time. And, and, and it was pretty obvious and patent that she found it really frustrating that in her mind she was being told that you sort of conjured up or imagined these sort of events such as a social services incident hoovering up the attention of the staff on ward um and uh, in the slide immediately in front of you is 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 her sort of case as it was um and there was a counter fact there was a counter case from the defendant which said well actually six, six o'clock there was it was fairly stable eleven o'clock Quite a, a um, quite a detailed examination, asymptomatic preeclampsia, and you know you do, there's an alarm provided. You don't help yourself during the night. You're bound to uh, press the alarm and summon help if you really thought there was an issue. And you know the, the, the tenor of the witness evidence from the woodwise was well, there was no so we can't recall any social services incident. We we can't recall anything particularly out of the ordinary. Was what the written evidence said. Well, so Vicky had that rocky time <laughs> in the box and. Um, but ultimately she was vindicated because the first midwife who had reviewed Vicky at about 6 p.m., mid midwife Hemmings, um, she gave up in cross-examination 
that this had in fact been one of the busiest you know, slash worst nights of her long career as a midwife, just in terms of how manic and drastically busy the department was. She conceded that she was worried about Vicky. Um, she conceded that she'd been unable to give her the detention she thought Vicky needed. And um, she conceded that this social services incident had happened. And it was almost like an unloading of sort of 14 years of worry and you know, sort of Catholic guilt rather than a fallback on a sort of a poor recollection. Um, uh, and then the second midwife's witness evidence, um, midwife Morton, her written evidence had committed her to this sort of gold standard review at 11 p.m. detailed abdominal examination, detailed consideration of symptoms, signs. And um, I think both because of the tenor of her evidence, um, she was uh, relaxed, didn't come across as a particularly measured witness, and her actual limited recollection of matters meant that she, she failed to come up to proof. Um, and I, I, I set out the judge's core findings, if we could just go over again here, and hope everyone's eyesight's better than mine. Um, and this is where we get to the, sort of the first part of, the, of this discussion, which is the approach to historic witness evidence. And the see here that the, the judge, uh, I've highlighted, I've underlined a paragraph 108. So the judge approached matters. What approach should the judge take to the medical records? And a, a key observation at paragraph 108, for the reasons I've already touched upon, the medical records in this case are not without difficulty given the known inaccuracies in respect of the entry made by midwife Hemming following the six o'clock observation. That was this unresolved ambiguity as regards whether or not there'd been a urine dip and what it had said. Um, and also she conceded that it had failed to record the fact that she'd given pain relief as well. Um, and then there's the entry made by midwife Morton after the events in the early hours of 7th of July. Now, we had some suspicions about when precisely the notes were backfilled in, but, but ultimately the midwife evidence, midwifery evidence was that both notes were entered, as was practice at the time, some hours after the actual um, review had taken place, which again called into question the inherent reliability of the notes because they were very much after the event notes. And as the judge said, approach the reliability of the two key entries in the medical entries would caution. And um, the judge then deals at power, you know, in the sections uh, I've said there with her summary of the, of the midwifery evidence uh, from the lay midwives, if I can put it like that, um, uh, and the criticisms that she could make. Um, uh, and therefore the judge found that there were breaches of duty from 6 p.m. onwards. She preferred the core narrative of the claimant finding that there was a core which ran through the case, regardless of some of the inconsistencies and some of the understandable difficulties that Vicky had in giving evidence. Uh, and ultimately there's a failure to seek OBS review. And of course I'll, I'll come on to the causation elements in due course. Um, but, but just going on to the next slide, I think just in terms of some of the headline points in terms of the approach to medical notes, which come out from this case and more generally, um, I think the present most useful case for practitioners in this area is, is HTR and Nottingham University NHS Trust, where our former DCJ in Bristol, um, Miss now Mr. Justice Cotter, um, deals with the well-known observations in Jasmine, Jasmine, which of course was the, the, the commercial case, which talks about how one weighs up witness evidence and contemporaneous notes, but it, it's in a commercial context. And I, I don't, as much as there's a, a lot of, weight and attention given to it. Um, I think the position in clinical negligence cases is more nuanced. Um, and HDR is the best starting point, I think, for any practitioner in this area. And um, if one goes to it, and it's it's recited in my judgment in Richards as well, um, uh, the, the, the observation of paragraph 12, in fact, which I've, I've just put there, is too obvious to need to state that simply because a document is apparently contemporary does not absolve the court of deciding whether it is a reliable record and what weight can be given to it. Some documents are by their nature likely to be reliable and medical records ordinarily fall into that category. Other documents may be less obviously reliable as when written by a person with imperfect understanding of the issues under discussion or an axe to grind. And uh, I've noted there that Mr. Justice Cotter added in some of his own observations in terms of conscious, unconscious bias. 
Uh, and of course, it was it was a hallmark of both sides examination in my trial. And one of the starting points was um, everyone's had a long time to think about this trial. And you you naturally as midwives going to be inclined to defend your own position. And Vicky, you're likely to become more and more entrenched in your views. Um, but I, I think one of the key observations is that of, uh, in the case of HXC and Hind, which was Barry Cotter in an earlier case, which he cited in HDR, which says the medical notes are no more than a starting point. Now, they can be the end point in the right case, but they are no more than a starting point um, that a record can be regarded as a likely correct and accurate record. And obviously, the records in our case were ultimately displaced because the judge found that the six o'clock record wasn't accurate for conceded reasons, and that the, the second record at 11 p.m., which said asymptomatic, detailed physical examination, didn't bear scrutiny against the witness evidence. And I think just going over Leaf again, Sarah, if I may, there's a few important considerations to have in mind. So, um, so in terms of my headline points in this respect, because look, each... It, it's a real issue at the moment, and there's an abundance of cases where, which turn on their own facts as regards whether or not um, medical notes should be accepted for the reliability of their contents or not. Uh, and I say, I think the principles are now well established from HDR, um, but one has to look, I, I think, there's it circumstances in which the notes are prepared. Um, as I've said, in Richards, accepted that both records are written up well after the event. Uh, the 6 p.m. note had that unresolved ambiguity. 6 p.m. note failed to recall that pain relief had been provided. So there was always, so in terms of my, you know, in terms of the, the preparation and the approach to your cases, there was a clear in here be, because there, there was an obvious inaccuracy in one of the notes or an unresolved ambiguity even going into trial where we had a strong narrative from the, the claimant to counter it. Um, so the starting point would be, well, actually, circumstances in which the note was prepared, when was it completed in relation to in the meeting? What was the detail in the note? Is there anything else which can immediately call into question its inherent reliability? Um, nature of the matters documented in the notes and uh, probably interacts with the strength of the witness evidence points, which I set out below. I mean, look, let's be realistic. Are you going to be able to displace a detailed note if you're acting for a claimant of the consenting process at a regular outpatient clinic appointment? if it's set out in detail and the like. No, if you're, if you're the defendant and, and you prove your witness, if you're acting for the trust, you you know, those are the sort of cases where you're gonna feel fairly robust and then claimants do tend to come unstuck. Um, uh, in the case of Watson and Lancashire, um, that was a case where, um, what to do with whether the signs and symptoms of a stroke should have been identified and the, the stroke avoided. Um, claimant, that notes were found to be logical credible they were detailed claimant oddities in account past capacity issues didn't come close i i, I think to displacing it um whereas in um htr um it was a, and it the issue was that barry cotter's case i've just referred to consideration of the reduced fetal movements at a consultation some 17 years before trial and Barry Cotter found that the clinician's evidence was coloured by subsequent years of practice and that the note of the consultation didn't in itself contradict the claimant's evidence as to what was discussed. Claimants are, you know, that the risks are raised and they're not dealt with. And that wasn't mutually inconsistent with what was recorded in the note. Um, but again, in both cases, it, it's tethered to weighing up the strength of the witness evidence, the claimant, Proofing, ensuring minimal inconsistencies in the presentation of the case over time. Defendant strengthened the clinician evidence to support the notes. It was a feature of the case of Richards that, for example, one of the midwives had said, I've got no recollection of a social services incident in her written evidence. And I suspect the reality of it was that um, it had been solicitor drafted uh, and she'd signed it and hadn't put much thought to it because you know, her evidence was, I, I spontaneously recall that 14 years later. And it was, it was quite drastic. It was quite interesting to deal with as counsel because I had a witness giving me very helpful evidence who was accepting our, our chronology and our narrative. 
but at the same time was departing drastically from her written evidence. So again, so uh, you know, I suppose the importance of the proof in process and the witness evidence process is highlighted, um, and that assessment of the strength of the witness evidence and the strength of the clinician evidence, um, you know, in terms of how things are weighed up. But cases like Richens, HDR, uh, uh, and there's other recent cases do show that notes can be displaced even in historic cases, and I think those those probably. HDR in particular, a good starting point for considering that. Uh, finally, just pause it, um, CXB in North Anglia NHS Foundation Trust. His Honour Judge Gore, now retired, no further comment. And um, forthright, characteristically, in rejecting that record should generally always be preferred to witness evidence under the Jessamine principles. Uh, and I think we now have the more nuanced position after HDR. But even in that case, he um, perhaps someone not inclined to be sympathetic to defendants in his approach, ultimately found that the witness evidence um, that there'd been a request for a cesarean section at appointment could not displace the, the notes and witness evidence to the contrary. So probably um, a suite of cases. I've just picked up the ZZZ case there. Um, it, it's less important, but um, there was a, there's probably an inaccurate nursing note when at which suggested that there was normal limb power when actually the expert evidence, the consensus was, well, that just couldn't have been the case. And the nursing note was therefore rejected on that basis. So you know, it could be you've got to weigh up the inherent accuracy of the note versus what the expert evidence tells you. So um, again, judicial fact finding some important principles there. And um, moving on then to causation. So it's helpful to just put up the claimant benevolence um, sheet for me. Um, Two core causation issues. Ought Vicky to have been transferred to the delivery suite upon OBS review? And what would have been the likely outcome on the delivery suite? Would there have been early emergency delivery? And left that right there. Would there have been emergency delivery in the early hours of Monday morning? Probably always inherently unlikely. Or would there have been some form of more intense monitoring on ward, on the delivery suite, such that there would be an indication of um, that. The, the impending catastrophic event, such that there would have been immediate intervention, as would be more immediate on the delivery suite, and, and baby's life saved. Um, defendant had Professor Tufnell as his, their object expert. It, he'd never been convinced that there was preeclampsia or, or symptoms on the preeclampsia spectrum. And um, he, he very much, he, he, and because of that, he sort of tethered himself to the midwives' evidence and the notes as regards with the low level symptoms. and. Um, he maintained that protein urea levels on the signs of preeclampsia would, would have been negative at most relevant times um, and, and that there, would, there was never really a, a need to transfer to the delivery suite. The height of it would have been some additional observations perhaps on the antenatal ward. Uh, and obviously the rejection of the, the midwife's evidence was helpful to our submission that he was coloured on that particular issue by the midwife's evidence and the notes and circumstances where, where evidence ultimately fell to be rejected. Um, but how did the uh, judge approach the reconstruction of what hypothetically would have happened in the counterfactual the hypothetical world? Um, I, we, we'd asked her to apply claimant benevolence. Um, what, is, what is that? I've, I've set out what I asked her to do, <laughs> which she recited in the judgment, um, which is effectively to approach uh, claimant's evidence sympathetic, sympathetically where there is a black hole of data because of the defendant's own negligence. So um, where the defendant had failed to carry out proteinuria tests to look at that and say, well, this is likely what the proteinuria would have said and to resolve that issue in favour of us where there was any conflict. And also to look at upon transfer to the delivery suite to say, absence of data as to what monitoring would have showed, monitoring data would have helped identify the impending catastrophe, therefore applying that benevolently in our favour. And um, what is clear of benevolence? It derives from the personal injury cases, um, it, but it's now well established that it can be properly applied to clinical negligence cases on breach of duty and, and causation, though its application in particular cases is often rejected. There's only a handful of cases really where it's successfully been applied in reported decisions. Um, it's often called Keith Benevolence because it originally derives from Court of Appeal decision 2010, Keith and Isle of Man Steam Packet Company. Um, 
it's an excessive noise exposure case. Isle of Man Steam Packet Company had not carried out noise surveys in breach of duty um, under the prevailing um, regulations applying to the, the control of premises. Uh, the noise surveys would probably have given the answer as to whether noise was excessive. Claimant's evidence was that it was excessive. Defendant's evidence was that it wasn't. And the defendant had created the black hole of evidence and the claimant's evidence was to therefore be approached benevolently. The noise was excessive because in breach of duty, the defendant has made it difficult or impossible for a claimant to reduce relevant evidence, which must run the risk of adverse factual findings. To my mind, this is just such a case. So, you know, claim of benevolence and adverse inference against the defendant pointed in favour of where the claimant said actually it was noisy, uh, and that's the height of the evidence he could really give on the issue, to favouring his evidence, um, absent the technical data which the defendant ought to have produced. Um, once it's relevant to clinical negligence cases, let's go to the next slide, please, Sarah. Um, I've cited a couple of decisions here. Um, JAH and Byrne, A. Martin Spencer J, 2018 decision. Um, there's a causation issue in that case. So, so he, he did apply claimant benevolence. It's, it's a helpful decision um, for looking at the principles and a case where it's actually applied. Would a competent vascular surgeon have initiated in that case anticoagulation in July 2012, such that the claimant would not have come to an amputation of the left arm? And um, there was a three week window and a question mark in the expert evidence um, as to at what point in time a, a competent treating surgeon might have fixed upon the need for anticoagulation. Uh, and it was finally balanced. I think the tenor of the evidence was there would be a range of opinion on that issue. Um, but you'll see what Martin Spencer Jay does in that decision. He, he says, well, look, the absence, I'm looking at what the evidence tells me where the need to delve into this hypothetical world has been caused by the defendant's negligence. And therefore, to the extent I can, I'm going to fit, I'm going to find that a competent surgeon would therefore, where well, there's a range of opinion as to whether they would have done, that therefore would have likely prescribed anticoagulation in time and therefore favour the claimant's account to the extent he could and therefore the claimant succeeded on causation in what was a naughty case. Um, the the um, Ioana's case, um, a more recent decision, it's good on the principles. Um, ultimately, uh, Claimant succeeds, but not on, in fact, the, the, the core claim of benevolence point it ran. Um, but a good example at paragraph 37, where counsel for the defendant concedes that if something probably happened within a particular range of days or weeks, then it would favour the claimant to find it happened at the beginning rather than the end of that range. And that's what claimant benevolence does. I think actually that is claimant benevolence distilled down to its. Um, core day-to-day -day application in our work. Um, I, I was going to mention it later, but, you know, I mean, the, the, the classic case of a failure to follow up a wrist fracture where there's generally a broadish consensus that within a certain number of weeks, there might have been conservative treatment and or a need for wiring or the like. And, it, you know, if, if one looks at what waiting times might be or referral times, and there's a range of opinion between claimants and defendants, in terms of conservative, non-conservative, generally, actually, claim benevolence principles tells us that one should fall in line with the claimant's evidence on those sorts of points. So it's a point to be wary on for defendants in terms of your risk approach, claimants, it's a useful point that can be made. Um, now, just then, and perhaps just an example of a recent case, different variation of the principle, which I had was a case of a, a deceased claimant. Um, whether or not deceased claimant would have acted on advice, um, but for negligence, so the um, the, neg the admitted negligence was a failure to have said you need to do this if you are taking this prescription. So sort of almost the reverse of a classic consenting case where someone says, well, I wouldn't have followed that course if properly consented or not entirely. Not a consent case, failure to give advice, which was mandated. Um, deceased claimant couldn't give evidence himself. Um, case law says, consistent with the claim of benevolence principle, courts should adopt the benevolent starting point that the reasonable person would follow such advice. Then the court weighs up 
is there any reason to depart from that? So it was not, it could not be fatal to the estate's case that the deceased couldn't give evidence on that point because the starting point was he would act as a reasonable person would do. And um, another useful example of it in process. And back to the Richards case, if I may. Um, if we could go over, thank you. And um, how was it applied in Richards? Well, it was it was applied by the judge, Clarence Benevolence, as to whether Vicky would have been transferred to the delivery suite. Um, the expert consensus, um, and again, in the context of the preeclampsia spectrum and symptoms and signs, was that at some point, um, there was the probability or the possibility um, of proteinuria in a urine dip. Defendant hadn't undertaken urine dips adequately or at all during the key periods. Um, our expert had said early evening there would have been a positive proteinuria result. Their expert, well, I'm, I'm perhaps a little bit tainted because I cross-examined him on the point. My impression was that he probably conceded it was that there was a probability um, sometime sooner in time, not far off what, they, what the claimant's expert had said, but ultimately he said there was an increasing possibility by the early hours of the morning, but not a probability. So th there, was a, there was a consensus that it would, that it, there's a range of opinion on it, but there was a general convergence of opinion that there was the distinct possibility, probability of um, approaching near a positive test. And, it, and that would have been a tipping point, a trigger for transfer to the delivery suite on the judge's analysis. Uh, and I'd, I'd said to the judge, you've got to apply claimant benevolence here because um, the, the experts both conceded it was just really difficult to say what the results might have been. And the judge said, well, the, the, the tipping point on this issue in your favour, claimant, is claimant benevolence. And obviously I've, I've summarised that in the extract I put there. It does have a role to play midway through the second paragraph when determining whether it is probable that proteinuria would have been present in the early hours of the morning. The claimants deprived of data both as to blood pressure and proteinuria. Dr. Gill, my expert, OBS expert, was supportive of proteinuria at this time. Professor Tufnell accepting of an increase in likelihood. Um, taking the expert evidence together with benevolence in favour of the claimant, I am persuaded that the claimant has established that it is probable that proteinuria would have been present by the early hours of the morning, approximately 3 a.m. And that's a tipping point. So we make it to the delivery suite. And I think probably touched on before, we'd always expect it. And I think there's always an understanding between the parties that as much of a defendant denied, we make it to the delivery suite if we made it to the delivery suite. So it was the inherent prospects of the safer on the delivery suite that, that one might expect the dominoes to keep rolling. Claimant's way on um, the causation arguments. Um, but unfortunately, the judge wasn't with us on the next limb. If we can just go to the next PowerPoint slide, Sarah. Um, the judge declined to apply it to the likely monitoring and observations in the delivery suite. And um, there was, uh, our argument was this, um, if he gets to the delivery suite, um, she's monitored, there's a large amount of data, we've got a vast black hole of data, not barely any monitoring from sort of midnight, 11, 11 p.m. midnight onwards, we'd have that data. Um, still births typically avoided in the delivery suite. The black hole of data arose due to negligence. Um, that, that data would have given us the impetus for um, an early delivery to avoid the, the fatal abruption. Um, but um, my expert in oral evidence had not been as strong as we'd hoped in relation to the probability of early delivery with that data. Um, she sort of said, even if we're in with data, it's just a possibility. I mean, it's more nuanced like that. The judges, as judges do, has taken the clean route through it and found that because our expert has said, even with the data, it was only possibility, you fail on the last hurdle. Um, the expert evidence on paper going into trial, and I would well, <laughs> might say even after trial, was that, well, actually, it was close enough to probabilities where the, the vast absence of data, where there's a general consensus of the in, inherent better prospects of safe delivery on, on the delivery suite, um, 
all pointed towards applying some form of clever claim of benevolence um, in favour of the claimants on this particular issue. But the judge said, if the judge said, I've got a convergence of expert evidence on this point, which suggests it's no more than a possibility. And Professor Tufnell was very robust on this particular aspect and saying, I, you know, I, I think we're talking a very low possibility of a safe delivery. And the judge says that claim of benevolence can't overcome the hard expert evidence on this particular point. Um, and benevolence was displaced by the expert evidence on that issue, um, very sadly for, for poor Vicky. Um, so a useful example of claimant benevolence um, in approach, because actually we, we did, we have it established on, it was used on one issue, but not on another. So it's interesting there. And obviously when looking at the more general practice points, reconstruction of the hypothetical causation world, um, I mean, the starting point is always going to be considering your question marks on timings in the diagnostic and treatment processes in most cases. You know, I picked on the example of a, the, the classic failure to follow up a risk fracture case. Um, one always has to look at the interaction with the expert evidence. Does the expert evidence give a complete answer on the point? And if it does, you're probably going to struggle for a claimant benevolence um, argument to succeed here. Um, what is the nature of the missing information? Is it information which is missing due to the breach of duty? Um, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes if there's no obligation, for example, for a medic to have kept a note of a particular record, uh, there's a very recent reported case on, on that particular issue, that's why I mentioned it. But if, if, the, if the information is not missing due to the breach of duty, you're probably going to struggle as a claimant to establish claimant benevolence. And that's the, a point to be live to you for defendants. Um, it is relevant to breach and causation. Uh, the case law establishes it can be applied to both issues in terms of um, whether data points towards. So, you know, in, in our case, it's more subtly done, but it was the absence of certain information in the early, earlier records helped support the later findings of breach of duty as well, although not directly addressed under the claimant benevolence principles. Um, I've just listed some cases. So successful application in, in Richards and, and JAH, um, unsuccessful in cases such as uh, ZZ Haynes and South Bend University Hospital NHH Trust in, and Ioannis. Um, they're, they're all cases which are worth looking at. There's a series of personal injury cases where it hasn't got off the ground. A lot of them can be distinguished on their own facts. I mean, I think a useful starting point is, is those five, five cases, one, two, three, four. Those five cases are highlighted there for looking at this principle. Um, because I think it's a wider application. It's sometimes not used um, as often as it could be. Uh, and it's a point for claimants to be live to and, and, and those acting for trust and health boards to be live to as well. Um, so um, that concludes this morning's, um, my, my part of the talk. I don't know if there are any immediate, oh, I can see one question. Uh, Joe Gillum, in relation to the question as to who our expert was, I've probably actually covered that as we've gone, but yeah, Joe Gillum. So we had Joe Gillum, they had Derek Tufnell, defendant, um, and the aspects of their evidence were referred to one another on various issues in the case of Professor Tufnell, um, basically wrote the guidelines on preeclampsia, a very accomplished expert as well. But um, I don't know if there's any other questions which arose out from that that there does tend not to be on these sorts of matters so um if people don't have any further questions please just send me an email and um, if you anything else comes to mind and um thank you very much for today everyone take care